Welcome to World of Monsters. I'm Monster Master Arthur, and today we're going to be discussing the Minotaur, or the Minotaur. Let's begin with outlining the basic appearance. As we all know, or many of us monster lovers know, the Minotaur is known to have the head of a bull, and the tail of a bull, and the body of a man or human. It has made its appearance throughout different stories and more or less as a race of its own, which makes sense logically. We'll get it deeper into that a bit later. Now, before I jump into the history, let it be known that the information presented on this series is a mixture of history mixed with my opinion. Our story today begins on the coasts of Greece, where we have a small island called Crete. Crete at this time was a great power, and it wasn't much liked by Athens or Greece. The king of Crete was Minos, and as many kings and queens at this time, he sacrificed bulls to a god. And at one point, Minos wanted a white bull, a great white bull, so he made a prayer. A prayer to the god Poseidon, the god of the seas. Poseidon heard the prayer and honored it, and in turn, the creation of the white bull was made. Minos was very pleased with it. At this point in history, the bull was a great symbol of power and strength and, of course, male potency. Minos didn't want to sacrifice this bull, so what did he do? He replaced it with another one and sacrificed that one to Poseidon. Poseidon was not happy with this, so he decided to punish King Minos. Therefore, Poseidon made the Queen Pasiphae, the wife of Minos, fall in love with the great white bull. And so she did. She secretly went to an architect and had him create and construct a costume. He carved a wooden cow and gave it to the queen. Pasiphae, or Pasiphae, took this cow into the field where the white bull was, got inside it, and you can imagine the rest. The white bull mounted the wooden cow and the queen inside and created the great minotaur. Nine months or so later, the minotaur was born. And as it grew, it grew more and more ferocious. Or so the stories tell us. And keep in mind, they're mostly based from Greece and Athens. They are a bit biased. And as the Minotaur grew, in the meantime, King Minos' son, Androgeus, was competing in athletic competitions in Athens, which would later be developed into the Olympic Games as we know today. Now, Minos' son was exceeding in all the sports events, and the surrounding Athenians and other competitors were becoming quite jealous. So, they killed him. Minos was in fury at this news. So he decided now to punish Athens. He contacted a great architect and had him design and create a huge cave of mazes, what we know today as the Great Labyrinth, the Labyrinth of the Minotaur. The Minotaur, at this point being fed human flesh, was placed into the center of the labyrinth. Minos then got on the ship and went to Athens. When he arrived in Athens, he demanded that seven virgin males and seven virgin females be sacrificed to the great Minotaur every nine years, or as some say, every year. On further research, it is known as the time of the full moon being in the equinox. In the meantime, a future hero was born. He was the son of King Aegeus of Athens and the queen and the god Poseidon. Now, this was not rare at the time for these legends. At this time, many kings and queens and people of such authority would breed with both the king or queen and a god, so that then the heir to the throne would reap both benefits from the human royalty and from the god or goddess. So, Theseus was born. Once Theseus got of age and became strong enough, he retrieved his father's sword and sandals. By the third time of the sacrifices to the Minotaur, Theseus was ready. So he volunteered. He volunteered to be one of the captives to be sacrificed to the Minotaur. He took his sandals and swords and boarded the ship with the 13 other unfortunate souls. Once Theseus arrived in Crete, another love story sprang. Ariadne, a high priestess, the first daughter of Minos, fell in love with Theseus. When Theseus was being held captive, she offered him a clue. A clue on how to beat the Minotaur. But on one condition, if Theseus would marry her after he came out. Theseus agreed, and Ariadne gave him the clue. 
literally gave him a clue. Because clue from Old English translation means ball of twine. Theseus was released into the maze with the 13 other captives. At the entrance, he tied the twine and then headed deeper into the mazes of the great labyrinth. Eventually, he finds the beast. He finds it sleeping. So what does he do? Does he attack it honorably and wake it up first? No. Theseus pounces on it. He doesn't even wait. He pounces on it and attacks the beast, giving him the benefit and advantage, and kills it with his father's sword. And the poor hybrid, known as the Minotaur, that never got a positive chance at life, died. Looking back, this may have been a huge symbol of Athens defeating and overcoming Crete. Theseus' father, the king of Athens, he told Aegis, when you return, if you are alive, raise the white sails. If you are dead, have the sailors raise the black sail. But remember, Theseus was still in his youth, and this was possibly a symbol and a lesson within the story of the carelessness of the youth. So, upon returning to Athens, Theseus did indeed neglect to bring up the white sails, and the black sails were up instead. At the sight of this, King Aegeus fell into a deep depression and sadness and plunged himself into the sea where he died. And until this day, it is still called the Aegean Sea because of that moment. What happened to Ariadne, the high priestess that fell in love with Theseus? Well, there's variations of the story. One of them is that she did marry Theseus, and as he ruled, she ruled with him as queen, but he was not happy with her. And another story was that as he was returning to Athens after defeating the Minotaur, she had fallen asleep and Theseus abandoned her on the island of Nexus. Later, Dionysus, the god of grapes and wine, found Ariadne sleeping on the island of Nexus, married her, and started a new adventure of their own. Theseus was a great influence and part of what became the great power of Greece at this time, and developed Athens into a power stronger than Crete itself. And as far as Crete and the labyrinth, if you visit Crete today, you will still find that there are ruins and caves that people consider to be the great mazes of the labyrinth. So there is something left. Is it truly apart from this story? This is where you have to go into your own adventure. There are different accounts of this story. This is more based on the Greek point of view, the Athen point of view, making the Minotaur seem very brutal and the location of Crete seem very brutal and ferocious and evil. So was it necessarily so? There are depictions of the Minotaur being represented as more human, more shall we say good. Now let's go into a bit more imagination, the appearance of the Minotaur. I like the traditional description of the Minotaur with the head of a bull and the body of a human. Now, why do we have a man? Because from the story. But as I mentioned before, the Minotaur started as a named monster, but later obviously developed into a race of its own, as we can see in many stories, movies, and games. And it makes logical sense, as it is a hybrid. And once one is created, another one can be created in the same fashion. Once you breed those, you start to genetically create a new race of its own. As I said, I like the traditional look of the Minotaur. Uh, there are also depictions such as in certain movies of the Minotaur being just a bull, that kind of deformed man or a deformed bull. Because if you think about it, if you mix a bull with a human, you could just have a really ugly creature that doesn't resemble much of either. That has logical sense too. Personally, I do like the body of a man, the head of a bull, but also I do like the idea of the body being of the bull and the head or the torso upper area of a human sort of like a centaur and that's also being depicted in artwork that has gone that goes back to the 16th century and probably even beyond so that is also an interesting depiction of it i imagine the minotaur is being very large also i would say if we're talking about size i would have to say probably at least six feet tall as bulls are much larger than humans in weight and size so if you combine the two it would make sense that it would be at least as tall as a taller human uh, i like to imagine them much taller as well i would go up to 20 feet 40 feet even I 40 feet would start to be pushing it. We're going to the size of giants and larger giants, but I do like to imagine them that height. Did I say 40 feet? Right. Yeah, 40 feet is pushing it a bit. 
they would be quite heavy, as you would imagine they would be probably quite lean, if they're lean and they're packed with muscle. If you check out pictures of muscular hormone packed bulls out there, you'll see what I mean. But uh, if you imagine a bull being a stocky sized bovine body, then the body could be very huge. As a dungeon master or a monster master or whatever you do with your work and you're working with the minotaur, consider other bovine species such as the bison of America or the American buffalo, water buffalo of Africa and Asia. So you have different types of bovine uh, species that you can mix with the human figure now and you can come up with some really cool designs. Also, upon big size and strength and huge muscles, you can imagine the weight will be very high. And it won't be a clumsy, it could be, you could create a huge fat minotaur that just sits there. You'll have both, but it could also be a fast moving, powerful, huge hulking creature. That's what I like to see the minotaur as. Giants, giants could be either, but giants could have more of that energy of just a human and maybe be a little slower. But I like to put that ferociousness and speed and power of a minotaur into this creature and just show it as a brute force, like a real hulking power. With that energy balanced into the appearance. Not just being huge, drawn down by our gravity here. More as being huge, but naturally that size, meaning it will retain its speed and its power at that size. As far as colors go, uh, we can go with the colors of the black and white cow. That could be even a specific clan of minotaurs. Uh, we have the brown and the blacks of bison and buffalo, and we can even mix it and make different sort of patterns and streaks or spots that correlate with these species. There could be other species of bovine that you can make up too, to go with your minotaur stories. When you look at older artwork of such creatures, they always seem to appear more slender, more humanoid. With newer artwork, you start to see more monstrous body types. For example, as we have here, it's a thicker body type. It's not just a man with a, with a bull head. It is the complete structure, the back, the chest, the arm, everything. The thickness and the length of the body parts are all correlated into a thicker, uh, monstrous creature. So therefore, as far as basic shape goes, I would say stocky, but lean. Or stocky and fat. Maybe your minotaur just gave up and drinks ale all day. Also, what I like about this creation here, we have the, the legs, the bovine type legs that you see on fawns and satyrs. Bovine legs, I think, add more to the entire balance of the creature, especially if its head is kind of lured down lower, uh, as you see in this miniature. Or you can make it upright, but consider it is a beast. Inside, you can imagine how the organs are, what sort of things are larger. You may want to think about your research on cows and the buffalo that we know and their stomachs, how they work and their lung size and all that to be considered. Would the minotaurs be eating human flesh? That's a big question. If, like in the story, it was raised on eating flesh, if you would raise a human by feeding them human flesh and create them in this really negative environment, they could become a monstrous thing. And personally, I believe if something like this was true, that's kind of what happened. It's not that naturally that creature wanted to eat human flesh, it's that it was trained to do so. So, you could imagine that they would be eating mostly greens, mostly plants, plant matter, vegetables, fruits, all that. Or possibly on the verge of being omnivorous, having that humanoid part in them. Being completely carnivorous, maybe some, maybe some clans, some warrior clans, they do that. But in general, the way their teeth would be structured naturally from the hybrid uh, mixture, they would probably be more leaning toward being herbivores, okay? Her herbivorous, herbivorous, or hisbivorous. <laughs> As far as the horns and the tail go, it depends how you want to run your minotaur creation story, but you could even have clip tails as a sign of uh, a specific clan. Probably not long, thick tails, either really kind of smaller tails or regular sized tails as we have in this miniature. And the horns, you can range them probably pretty short 
to quite long. I think you can have a lot of fun with the horns. Remember, it could be a bit deformed. It could even have three horns or a little bit disorganized. It's all up to you. Also, accessories, I think, are a great part of this creature. You can either have it naked, which is fine, but it all depends how intelligent you consider the creature. If you consider it intelligent enough to have its own society and link with other societies, you could probably imagine it, it would be covering its specific areas. Maybe the females will be bare-chested, as uh, that's a common thing among societies, even that are linked with other ones. But maybe the lower parts will be covered. So you could think about that. Cover it with a skin or with simple uh, leather pants, pelts, things like that. The the funner part for me are the accessories you can add. Minotaurs probably would go well with metals and large stones. So you can tip the horns with golden crowns or silver crowns or or whatever metal you think up. And of course the pierced nose, different styles of why don't you pierce, you know, the nostril a different way or the top of it. Uh, maybe some golden teeth or capped teeth, uh, pierced ears. I even did that with my Minotaur artwork. Or maybe even tattoos. Now it's a furry animal, so maybe certain parts of it aren't covered with fur, and there they would have tattoos, maybe bright colored tattoos, since their skin would be maybe black or brown, so you can't see the tattoo color. Maybe there's specific inks that are white and brighter, like glyphs, maybe glowing glyphs, or maybe certain clans shave a certain part or they burn off a certain part of their body so the hair doesn't grow there and tattoo that area. Those are other things to consider. As far as the armor is concerned, you can consider the skin as being quite thick chain armor, maybe pelts and leather of larger animals such as rhino pelts, and also plate armor and, as I mentioned, chain armor. Uh, plate armor such as brass, copper, silver, gold, I would see that work well as well. Weapons, we're probably looking at large weapons, not stealthy, thin, small swords and knives, but rather large axes, clubs, maybe even claymores, oversized swords, something that correlates well with their brute strength and character. Also, you probably would have classes that don't use weapons and just go off of hand-to-hand -hand battle. And as aforementioned, shamans and other casting classes, whereas they would have maybe just pelts, uh, more jewelry type accessories, lighter armor and clothing. Probably wrestling would be something that would be common in sparring, throwing boulders and th other creatures and items and things into their opponents, as well as simply using their mouths, huge fists, legs, and of course the horns. The horns will be a major, could be a major asset as well. Could there be bow and crossbow wielding minotaurs? It's possible. As always, there are exceptions. Of course, it'd be fun to see these exceptions in works and in various worlds as well. Family structures could be based on a mother and father basis, or even based on a, forgot the word, where the young are raised basically by the society, by the culture. So you have males and females that breed once they have a baby, uh, that child. Minotaur is then brought up by all the adults around, not just the parents. So that depends on you, or different clans could have different. There could be different levels of intelligence. Maybe the black and white minotaurs are the intelligent ones, the ones that have more shamans, and the more bison type, or more warrior-like. The imagination can go endlessly into awesome depths of creation, so do have fun with that. Uh, let's see, what other monsters can we compare and define similarities to with the Minotaur? Possibly centaurs, if we do use the body, the lower body structure of the Minotaur, uh, of the bull, just like we have the horse body of a centaur and the torso of a man. We could have similarities with that, and maybe even in their society and culture, although centaurs seem to be, in many stories, at a different, less maybe primitive level. Beastmen. Although I would consider beastmen a bit of a uh, less stocky, smaller species as they would be more mixed with goats and smaller such quadrupeds. Other similarities, similarities in power, probably to smaller giants, cyclopses, cyclopsi, trolls, ogres, and the like.
I would say, as far as Minotaur culture and society goes, if you look at bovine and how they live in smaller herds, there would be a society, there would be clans, but I wouldn't imagine maybe a huge kingdom of Minotaurs. Uh, you have superiority issues amongst the males where they have to battle each other to gain a higher position, higher ranks. It would probably be a society that may start out a little bit primitive just because of the stubborn aspects to the bull and uh, that kind of animal if we want to look at it from that aspect. Probably smaller groups, societies ruled by a leader or a leader and the queen. Families would be very honorable, I would say, very honored, uh, protected. There would be a lot of honor in battle, I would say. As far as uh, scientific and works into clockworks and magic, things like that, I would say parts of society. I would say it's a society that would have possibly a shaman and some of the elders in the clan and such. In time, they would probably develop and become huge as societies, but I think the issue here would be the competitiveness of the males, and that would keep the societies smaller and more diverse and spread out. Again, you can you can create whatever you want. The factions of the Minotaurs would probably be connected with other mammal type species, warm blooded species, and just uh, honorable species species that try to trick you and cheat you, I think they wouldn't hold much patience for species like that. So could they be befriended with a lizard type species? Sure, if they hold that certain honor and age-old kind of attitude. And probably it would depend on the clan and the agenda of the clan or society. Classification of the creature, animal hybrid beast type mammal. And probably based on vegetarian foods. Uh, power level, my fun little power level, uh, ranking. One being a slug, ten being a celestial being. I would say the Minotaur would be at about a four. Weaker Minotaurs go down to a power level of three or up to even a power level of five, but an average I would say a four. As we can have with humans. With humans you can have very weak humans or you do have larger, more powerful people, so there are exceptions. As far as types of Minotaurs and possibilities, I would say Minotaur can be anything from a deformed bull to a deformed mutated human. A humanoid with some horns, as you will see in, in some movies and depictions in stories. You can have fur, you can have no fur, you can have a lot of fur. It depends on what you decide to mix your minotaur with, and which parts you want to keep human, and which parts you want to keep bovine. You can get pretty creative with it. All right, finally, here are some sources and references. I won't mention games as the Minotaur appears in many, many games. Now, as far as movies, here are some movies to note. First of all, I want to mention an episode of Hercules. If you remember the old Hercules shows, there was a, an episode called Hercules in the Maze of the Minotaur. That episode had a pretty decent depiction of the Minotaur. Next movie that deserves to be mentioned is Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief. I have to say, the way they depicted the Minotaur in that movie, the size, the power, even though he got beat too fast, the Minotaur just gets beat too easily and too fast in most of these movies here that I'm going to mention. And that's unfortunate, because it's a great creature and deserves the honor of a good battle. But in that movie, I love the depiction of the Minotaur. Another one is Wrath of Titans, which is the adult kind of version of that story with Perseus, and more traditional with the timing. Over there we have the Minotaur as more of a, more of a deformed man-bull mix, and which is cool. It's more maybe realistic, I would say. Chronicles of Narnia is another one where they depicted the Minotaurs well, and they showed him in battle. Maybe one of my favorite parts of the movie were those battles, but the Minotaurs look great in there. So gotta hand it to the artist for that. What kind of depiction of the Minotaur do you like? Do let me know below, I'm really curious. You can also see the Minotaur in various cartoons, such as Gravity Falls, and that had a pretty funny episode with Minotaurs in them, and many other places. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, at least enjoy the historic aspect. If I make any mistakes or if you have anything to add, please do it down below. And remember, please feel not just free, but welcome, welcome to request 
what monster you want me to talk about next. Until next time, this has been Monster Master Arthur on the Minotaur or the Minotaur.